Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. I'm your very, very happy host. So right now, you guys, we are in a series called For the Love of Transitions. Just felt like this is where we're at right now. Um, In our personal lives, in our communities, in our churches, in our culture, we we are moving from what has been to what will be in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. And so as we talk through all kinds of transitions, actually in the series, one in particular that obviously means a lot to me that I'm watching, that I care about um, is, is what we're witnessing within the church, the transitions inside. And when I say the church, you know, that's a huge umbrella term, like with a lot of, that's, there's a lot under that, but for lack of a better way to describe it, I would say like the institution of the church, right? Let's, let's think of it like that. Um, I mean, obviously there's the, uh, literal transition for, you know, the majority of us in 2020, there weren't, there wasn't church, there wasn't in-person church, live services at churches were shut down, um, which had an effect on our communities. And, you know, we are transitioning right now back into some of the old structures and what that, and, and leaving some behind, frankly, but, um, but what I'm going to talk about today with my guest is more, it's a little bit more at the soul level. Um, because statistically speaking, unambiguously, there is a, a downturn, a big downturn in the number of people who um, affiliate themselves with a certain like religion or denomination, and less and less people who are even calling themselves Christians. Um, in 2019, only 65% of people who affiliated themselves with a religion identified as Christian which is a downtick of 12% over the last decade, which is a lot in 10 years. That is a lot. Um, And meanwhile, on the flip side of that, those who describe their religious identity as atheist or agnostic or nothing in particular now stands at 26%, which is up 17% from 10 years ago. So it's going like this, right? Um, What does this mean? This is what we're going to talk about today. What does this level of transition mean? This fast level of transition. Um, What does it mean for people? What what is under it? What is inside of this? What's the nuanced way to think through um, these shifts? What what do we think it's going to mean? Um, And... And let me just say up front, I, there's one sort of school of thought around this, which is um, probably what I grew up in, uh, this, this perspective that I, I was taught, which is essentially, um, this is just par for the course. Like, we live in a godless world, and it's all going to hell in a handbasket, and this was to be expected, and, you know, whatever's left is the faithful remnant, and I guess we're just going to sit in the pews and watch the world burn down around us because that was always going to happen, and we can blame all this on immorality or um, godlessness or a lack of faithfulness or whatever, right? Like kind of casting a, a shame blame on people who have left the church or are leaving or want to leave. But I don't really believe that. I That's not my faith perspective at all. I don't... Um, I don't think that's how it is. I, um, I see the, the primary source of disalignment, like where we see people unable to hold a label they once had, even unable to go to a church they once went to. 
as not at all um, a result of faithlessness. I see it as a result of a complete disconnect and disassociation with the institution. Um, that the it's the institution that is failing, not the people. Does this make sense? Um, and that honestly, I mean, I don't know if this is an unpopular thing to say, but it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, I think enormous parts of the institution um, have failed. So let them fail. Let them fail. Let them run out of steam. Let them run out of gas. Um, because you can't take faith or God away from anyone. <laughs> the church never had the rights to it. They don't hold the deed, right? To what a flourishing faith looks like in a human heart. And so I, my sense of it is that more and more people are unwilling to settle for an institutionalized faith that is so clearly at odds with Jesus <laughs> and, and his words and the way he lived and what he told us to care about. And so the cognitive dissonance became too much. That's what I think. That's what I see. And, you know, I'm very deeply on record having walked through my own transition inside my faith system publicly for the last, I'm going to say 10 years and um, have increasingly, and, th and this is a strange thing for me to say, because of course I'm a church planter, Austin New Church here in Austin is the one we started and the one I still attend. Well, virtually, we're not back yet, but, um, but I increasingly find Jesus, I find healing and I find wholeness and hope and faith completely outside of structures, outside of institutions, even the one that I love, even, even the one that I still love. And so... We're going to talk about all this today. Um, we are going to talk about the on-ramp, the spiritual on the 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 system, the systemic on-ramp that got us to where we are today inside of our structures and institutions. Um, what evangelicalism, how it was birthed, and why it brought us all the way to Trump. And we're going to touch on that for a second. We're going to talk about a lot of hope. And um, I think you're going to, I think you're going to love this conversation because it's a super complex topic, obviously, that doesn't have a clear answer, but that is why I invited Diana Butler Bass to join me today on the podcast to talk it through because I love her approach. She has receipts. Um, she's she's done this work. She did the work of sort of deconstruction and reimagining her faith 20 years before a lot of us have done it now kind of in mainstream culture. Um, and we talk a lot about that and what sent her away and what, sh where she went, what, where she landed. And she's a wonderful teacher. Um, Diana is the author of 11 books on American religion that are incredibly insightful. Her latest book is called freeing Jesus. And I love that in this book, she invites us to leave the religious wars behind and rediscover Jesus beyond the narrow confines we have built around him. Isn't that great? She is a really important voice to help us work through the complexities of how communities of faith fit into our world today. Um, Diana holds a PhD in religious studies from Duke. She's taught at the college and the graduate level. She's currently an independent scholar, columnist for the New York Times Syndicate, writes for HuffPost and Washington Post on religion and spirituality and culture. So to say that she is immersed in the world of religion specific to the U.S. is an understatement. Um, she's smart. She's wise. She's kind. Um, she's very, very studied here. And so I, you're going to love this conversation. You guys, I'm, I loved it. We went way over our allotted time because there was just so much to say. Um, so I'm delighted to bring you my conversation with the insightful and delightful and wonderful Diana Butler Bass.
so absolutely delighted to see you and to have you on the show. Hi, Diana. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. Oh, thank you, Jan. This is, it's just great to be here. I have followed your work for years, um, absolute years. I'm, I'm actually trying to remember where I was first introduced to you. And would it, would it make sense to, to remember that Sarah Bessie introduced me to you? This is what my memory is giving me. Um, that's probably true. Yeah. I, I can't kind of remember where I met Sarah for the first time, but it must've been through Rachel Held Evans. Yeah. Yep. So. Well, I really appreciate your mentorship. And when I first began hooking in to a new conversation around faith, around the interpretation of scripture, um, around its manifestation in the here and now. And I, I stumbled, I was, I luckily stumbled into your room and discovered this wide array of women who were deeply thoughtful and educated and committed to faith, asking different kinds of questions than I'd ever asked. Um, coming up with different ideas than I'd ever heard. I mean, it was like, I can kind of feel it in my bones, how it felt to me to discover you and the community that you were embedded in. It was just like the lights turned on in the room for me. I, it was such a joy to discover that my teeny little bubble of conservative evangelicalism was not all that there was. I had no idea. <laughs> I thought that was the whole world. It was, it was for me for a very long time. I had no idea. Well, you know, it was for me too yeah. for a very long time. And um, I actually was born and raised uh, Methodist. Hmm. And so I was born into this sort of mainline family and was yeah. raised in the church in the 1960s, which sure middle ages. Um, and um, so, so I had this very almost conventional sort of church upbringing from the middle part of the 20th century. And when I was uh, 13, my parents moved from uh, er from Maryland to Arizona, which was just a huge, huge move. Mm. And it, it up, it up ended my life. I mean, everything I knew just disappeared basically in a trip in a station wagon across the United yeah. States. Mm. And when we got to Arizona, my folks uh, joined this local Methodist church and mm -hmm. it was a terrible church. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just boring. Yeah. And there was no sense of life there for the kinds of questions that mm. a 13 year old in 1972 was asking. Sure. And so I wandered with some friends of mine over to this evangelical church. Mm. I didn't even know what evangelicalism mm. was. Somebody had mm -hmm. to explain it to me. Yeah. And um, it was called Scottsdale Bible Church. Yeah. And when I was there, you know, they all wanted to say, you know, have you been born again? Totally. And they yeah. gave me the language and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that was really the place. It was when I was 14, 15 years mm. old that I got introduced to evangelicalism. And yeah. then once I was there, it kind of became everything hmm. for the next 17 years yeah. and getting out was, was really, really hard, hmm. um, but I had to, you know, for the, for the sake of my own soul, I had to, I had to leave that world. And um, it was, uh, I know you're working around the idea of transitions. It was an unexpected uh, change. It was not one that I really wanted to make, mm -hmm. uh, but the sort of the pressure coming from several different directions, uh, theological, yeah. my own sorts of personal questions, and then institutional. Cause I was, when I left, I was working as a college professor, I was teaching religious studies at an evangelical college mm -hmm. and to maintain sort of institutional loyalty and be the first woman to ever teach theology at a place mm -hmm. like that was probably one of the most difficult things that I've done Wow! and it didn't work out. And, um, I had to, I had to leave. And when I left, um, 
I left my first marriage. I left the college. Yeah. I left my theological tradition behind and I literally didn't know where I was going to land. And so um, I made this journey out of evangelicalism that so many people are making now. That's right. I made it back in the early nineties. Yeah. And yeah. so most people, when they find my stuff, you know, they have your experience. They say, Oh, yeah. wow. I never knew liberal Protestantism existed. And yeah. this, this is cool. And look at the way women are treated and the roles they have. Yeah. Well, I had to, I had to find that too. Hmm. Um, it, it was my childhood f- sort of tradition, but a lot had happened in those sure. years when I was gone. And so when I got back toward it and I came, I went to the Episcopal church rather than the Methodist church, um, I was so grateful. Hmm. You know, I was grateful for women ministers. I was yes. grateful for a whole different right. conversation totally. about gay and lesbian people. Yeah. I was, I learned the Bible basically anew. Hmm. And so, so uh, I can, when you talk about your, you know, story of, of finding my stuff um, when you have struggled yeah. about whether or not to, you know, do I stay? I must leave, yeah. you know, this kind of thing is like, well, I had to do that too. Yeah, you did. I, I just did, did a little bit earlier. And mm-hmm. that meant that when the time is ready, um, my friends showed up, you know. Mm. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that because you plowed up a lot of soil um, on some pretty hard ground that a lot of us have now tread upon a lot. And, you know, I had, and I I really mean this sincerely, the advantage of the internet when, when I began this walk, because I, I had access to work like yours. I had access to Rachel. Um, I just, with the click of a, of a button, I could read mind blowing new perspectives. And it, it, I, I consider that like almost my seminary, you know, the, the internet provided leadership for me when I didn't have it in my personal life. And so I'm grateful for you. I can only imagine how lonely that must have felt because in the early nineties, I mean, I, I'm, my brain is reaching for who your mentors would have been. Um, and that must've been kind of a lonely walk. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more. I have two things that I want you to touch on here. Okay. Um, I would like to hear you say a little bit, if you could expand on why you said I had to go, I had to go. I had to go for my own soul. I'd like to talk about that. Why? What does that mean? And then if you could talk a little bit about what your, what work you transitioned into, like I keep referring to your work that I have, I have consumed. So I'd like, for you to tell my listeners what that work is um, and what it is that you do and, and where you spend your energy and your influence and your wisdom. My work is that I'm a teacher. That's really all I ever wanted to be. I dreamed of being a college professor. I wanted to be in a classroom and help students see the world more clearly and understand their place in it. You know, and so that's really, that's really the calling of a teacher. And when I was in college, I thought, because uh, I was for, still a pretty conservative evangelical, I thought that I had to do that, like being an elementary school teacher, mm. which is a very valiant profession. And sure. I know how hard it is, sure. you know, because I have kids. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't. So I started majoring in education. And it just wasn't a fit for me. And mm-hmm. what I loved was theology and church history. Right. And even though my church said that back home in Arizona, when I, and then I was in college in California, my church said to me, oh, it's too bad you're a girl. Yeah. Because if you were a boy, you could go to seminary. Right. And that just made me mad, you totally. know, really just pissed me off. And yeah. I mean, <laughs> so I was always a little rebellious yeah. <laughs> along the way. And um so I, I went, when I, the education thing didn't work out, I thought, what do I love? And I thought, mm. oh, I, lo- I love theology and church history. I love studying religion. And yeah. so I, I wound up majoring in that and sociology um, mm. at the same time. And it, it, I just wanted to be a teacher. So then I went on to seminary and went on to get a PhD and did get a, got, got my PhD at Duke in uh, 1991 mm. in 
religious studies slash the history of Christianity. Mm. And so that's what I was. My work was as a teacher. And I imagined when I got that work, you know, being a college professor and, and writing books on the side. Yeah. And of course, what happened is that it all shifted. Mm. Um, and the way it shifted is probably the most dramatic moment when I knew I'd have to leave. Mm. It was the second or third semester I was teaching and my job, part of my job was to teach introduction to Christian doctrine, Mm. which was a required class of freshman students. And so I remember standing in front of this classroom, it was probably about 30 students in it. And I mean, I can remember what the day looks like Mm. still. Um, And I was lecturing on the doctrine of humankind, Mm -hmm. anthropology, you know, and the, the lesson was supposed to be on Genesis and the, and the idea of sin. And so I, you know, got out my Bible and was reading these passages to the students and was getting ready to introduce them to the idea of original sin in the fall. Mm. And um, I, so I, I said, what happens uh, to human beings in the first uh, three chapters of Genesis? Um, And the students kind of looked at me, they're so tired, you know, Mm. like students do. And I said, okay, let's read something. So I started reading out loud from Genesis one and God made and God made and God said it was good. God said Mm. it was good. God said it was very good. Mm. And um, as I read the passages, I was getting more kind of excited about it. And finally, this one young woman, she said, she said, I know what happens. I know what happens. And I, I said, what is that? And she said, in the fall, God made me evil through and through. Mm. And mm. It, it was like the universe stopped spinning. Wow. Because here's this, this beautiful, intelligent, mm. amazing young woman with this, you know, just, you know, 18 year old glowing yeah. sort of persona. And she says, in the fall, God made me evil through and through. And I said, read it with me again. And I mm-hmm. had, I, we read it out loud. I said, and God made the heavens and the earth. And what does God say? And they, they're looking at me like I'm nuts. Yeah. And they said, God said, it's good. And I said, and then God made the animals. And what does God say? God says, it's good. God made man and woman. And what does God say? And someone stopped and said, it says very good. Mm. God made humankind very good. Mm. And I said, that's today's lesson. Never forget it. And I was like, I was just so upset. And I walked out of the classroom and I knew they'd fire me. Wow. Gosh. Because I had just gone over the one line you couldn't go over. And that was that I insisted that Mm. creation was good. Wow. And it was another sort of, two and a half really terrible years of mm-hmm. me being there trying to figure out what comes next um, and also fighting it. Cause, cause I thought, you know, this isn't fair. It's not fair to the students and maybe this theology can fit there, but I, I felt like I discovered it that day in the classroom. Wow. And um, they said, no, they literally told me when they got rid of me, the president of college looked at me and said, you don't fit. Yeah. And that's where I, I left. I mean, you know, I fought it with a lawyer and stuff, but (laughs) but, uh, I, I, I just knew that Mm. I was gone and that there was really no turning around theologically from that moment. Yeah. So that's, that's how dramatic it was, Mm. but it also took some time, you know? So there's the drama moment when you realize that everything is changing, but then after that, you know, there's the moment when you say, maybe that didn't really happen, or um, perhaps I can still make this work. Sure, of I, course. You know, all that kind of human yeah. stuff. Yeah. So after that, then, you know, the question was, okay, I don't think God's taken away my calling, my desire to be a teacher. Yeah. So how is that going to happen? And instead of in the classroom, and I've, I've taught a few times at different schools um, right. si- since then, uh, but there was never really that sort of love of, 
you know, falling in love with teaching at an institution ever again. Mm -hmm. And so that, so after a few tries and Mm -hmm. some good experiences, I said, you know, maybe there's a whole different place for me to be. And um, my, my husband, who's now my husband of 25 years uh, said, okay, let's take a chance. You've always Mm -hmm. wanted to, you've always wanted to write. So let's do it. And that's what started happening. I began teaching through books. Yeah. And um, eventually social media, Mm -hmm. you know, engagements, things like that. So that's the work. The work is putting these beautiful words in the world, Mm -hmm. opening people's eyes to things they haven't seen. And um, I guess that's the work because that's what happened to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is the work. And, And I'm grateful for it personally because... I know how I felt and I, I know my community too. I know that a lot of my listeners um, have this sense of, of co- cognitive dissonance. They have this sense of um, being out of alignment in some way in terms of the expression of their faith, but they don't have the language yet. They, they're not, it's, it's vague. It's a feeling. It's a gut sense. I, 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 I went on nothing but a gut sense there at the beginning. Like this cannot be right because this expression of theology is just producing so much heartache and death. That can't be right. That's not how the equation works. I don't know everything, but I do believe that Jesus is life and joy and love. I I, I think he's life and love. And so if, if everything that I'm clinging to seems to produce the opposite, something is wrong. And so, but I'd have any words for it. And so I'm grateful for people like you who were ahead and could begin to parse it out and, and not just no longer just located in the gut in intuition, which is a perfectly fine way to experience the Holy spirit, by the way, I'm not dogging on that, but yeah, you began absolutely. to put mm-hmm. ac- academia to it and theology to it and doctrine to it and interpretation to it. It was incredibly thoughtful and heady even. And, ah, oh, what a relief. It's such a relief to know you're not crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, part of the the time between the realization and then the time I left, um, I spent a lot of time in the library. Mm, yeah, you know, I, I just I was looking since there was no Internet, you know, it's like, where do you find people who have said stuff like this before? And so I headed to the library and I looked up books by people who had been uh, sort of my evangelical mentors had looked down their noses on these people. Mm, mm-hmm. And so I thought, Hmm, if these people <laughs> yes. don't like these yeah. books, let me maybe read them. There's, yes. Maybe there's something in those books that I need to read. Totally. And those books included, you know, really interesting stuff. It was then I became acquainted with um, historical, uh, critical biblical scholarship much, much better, and Mm. eventually became friends with a couple of people who are really important biblical scholars, a couple of whom have since passed away. Mm. Um, And then uh, I read a lot of feminist theology and started reading the mystics Mm. and, um, you know, just all the the forbidden list of books. Sure. <laughs> and those books became those books became my friends. Yeah. I want to um you're a student obviously of religion. You pay attention to culture. You you have your finger on the pulse of um what is very much a, a transitional moment in the church. Um, I, I shared earlier with my listeners some stats about the, the pretty dramatic decline of, of the number of people who are attending church or even affiliating with a religion um, and, and how less and less and less people are even calling themselves Christians. I wonder if you can just talk about from your vantage point, how, how you've seen the church. And of course, that's such a, that's such a big word. You know, there's so many slices to the church pie. I know, (laughs) but from a high level, how you have seen the church shift and evolve in the last, let's just say 
five years, even 10, even 10 years, I think is probably a better marker for Mm -hmm. what we are like watching in real time with our eyes. We, as you've asked me, you know, about my transition and sort of how, you know, how I got to be who I am, you, you made that comment and a boy that just like hit me like, like a brick when you said um, you must've been lonely. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I, I kind of was lonely because there weren't these other, you know, easy ways of getting at information, mm. uh, but we didn't know that then. I mean, there wasn't an internet, right. Right. so it was like, right, totally. Was, it, it was just kind of normal. Yeah. Um, and so the library was my friend. And mm-hmm. then I did find friends in another place. And that was this really quirky, um, very progressive Episcopal church. Sure. Uh, I was living in Santa Barbara, California. And the reason I found that church is that when I was in this deep crisis at the college, uh, word reached me that the, the minister at Trinity Episcopal Church had organized all the other ministers who were liberal ministers in town okay. and gone into the presence office and stood up for me. Wow. People who were total strangers wow. just mm. heard, heard what the college was doing to me and they thought it wasn't fair. Wow. And so they organize this sort of communal community Hmm. conversation with the, with the president of the college and said, don't, you've got to be good to this person. She's, Hmm. she's a really, she's a, she's a human being and she's a really valuable person. And so, Hmm. so anyway, I heard that he did this and I went to the church uh, because I wanted to just thank him. And um, what I discovered was remarkable. Uh, Hmm. He was actually gay Mm-hmm. And it was 1993, mm-hmm. and he was the first ever out gay person to be a minister in all of the Episcopal Church in Southern wow. California. Wow. I mean, so you talk about something that's changed a lot. you know, Yeah. Recently. Oh, gosh. Right. And so he started telling me what was going on at the church and what was happening there. And this is so relevant to this mm. whole conversation is that the church had basically died. Mm. It had gone from 600 people in the 1960s to less than 60 people yeah. in 1990s. And the, the diocese of Los Angeles sent this guy into this church because they thought he couldn't do any harm. Hmm. And they also thought nobody would ever notice that they put a gay minister. Oh, they'd just <laughs> skip over that, would they? <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. put a, they put this gay yeah. guy in charge yeah. of this dying congregation. Yeah. It's, like, it's kind of like no harm, no foul. Like, right? Yeah. <laughs> Getting rid of a problem, you know, sure. the whole thing. Yeah. And so um, what happened was the congregation had begun to turn around. Sure. And he had vision and the people who were that little tiny remnant, mm. they had amazing vision. And so when I got to the church and I met them, I was, the people who were there were remarkable mm. and I just stayed and they became mm. um, really some of still my best friends. I mean, I was not lonely. Uh. And while I was there mm. in the years that I lived in Santa Barbara between so this was like four or five years that I was really active in this church. I moved in 97. Um, the church just sort of came out of the closet as this sort of open, progressive, yeah. gay, friendly, mm-hmm. we'll try anything, mm-hmm. um, new liturgy, feminist friendly. I mean, mm-hmm. just the whole thing yeah. kind of church. And it was the kind of church that everybody said would never work because they totally. didn't, didn't want that. Mm. And yet at Trinity mm-hmm. in those five years, the church went from 60 people up to 400 people. Right. And we saved the church. We were able to raise money to save the building. The building was falling down. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, everybody in the whole of Santa Barbara County knew about this this crazy church with this out gay minister and people would come from all over the County just to see if it was really true. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. And it was. And so what I saw there was that there was a place for people who had been cast out. Yeah. And more than just like a place where you'd hide in the corner, Uh but 
Mark, he stood behind the table. Yeah. And there was a woman assistant and there were older people and younger people and people who only spoke Spanish. And I mean, there was literally every kind of humanity. Mm. We would just on Sunday morning, this, the church was on the main street and we would just open the door and people would wander in off the street, mm. sit down and, and we'd hear story after story after yeah. story about how their lives changed. And so it was this church that opened my imagination to what church could be mm -hmm. about hospitality, about risk, about courage, about seeing and reading the Bible in new and different mm -hmm. ways, about really taking, uh, taking the edges and moving them towards the center. And that's when I started to write about church. Mm. Uh, and um, I wrote this column in the Santa Barbara News Press for several years. And I would write stuff that happened in the church. And, and people would come to the church on the basis of what they read in the column. Mm. And so we were doing, essentially, I was doing evangelism, which was like <laughs> right. not anything I ever thought that I would do. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we were experimenting with what we imagined to be the church of the future. And it worked and it still works. Um, Mark was there for, I think, 28 years when he finally retired. Wow. wow. Oh. That's longevity. It really was. Mm -hmm. And so he retired just a couple years ago. And now they have a, a woman who is their new minister and the church is, I think about it's stabilized around 600 people, which yeah. is an extraordinarily big church. Yeah. And, in on a west coast totally sized town yeah and um and so that's just stayed with me and i've worked out of that model mm. uh for all these years you know it's like what did they do right mm -hmm. you know, what did they really do right and they did a lot right i have two fun words i want to talk about steam and edutainment are you familiar with these terms steam represents the subjects of science technology, engineering, arts, and math. And edutainment is this fusion word that basically means educational entertainment. Here's another word, KiwiCo. It's a company that is basically the easy button for STEAM-based edutainment for your family delivered right to your door. Because whether the school year went by for you in a flash or literally took 1 million years, summer is basically here now. You might already be making a mental checklist of creative summertime activities to keep the kids busy and engaged without all the screens all the time. That's one of the reasons I really love KiwiCo. They make educational activities entertaining with monthly crates of STEAM projects, projects that are designed to spark curiosity and creativity and a love for learning. How about sailing the solar system or building an animation machine? Cool, right? And that's not even scratching the surface of everything KiwiCo puts in these boxes, which are shipped right to your door. Plus, KiwiCo covers all ages. It's not just for littles. Both the Maker Crate and the Eureka Crate are for teens to adults, where sample projects include things like making a macrame planter or an LED desk lamp or a wooden ukulele and so much more. That's legit stuff, you guys. The finished products are both fun and functional. So remember, with KiwiCo, there's something for every kid and kid at heart every month. So get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with the code for the love at kiwico.com. So that's 30% off your first month at kiwico.com promo code for the love. It's interesting because what I see at large, which you've kind of encapsulated in this kind of micro story that you just shared is that as I kind of, as I also kind of watch the, the numbers around church and identification, um, even labels really take a major turn. Um, what a lot of the research shows us is that people are indeed, I mean, it is unambiguous that they are leaving the church. That they are correct. leaving behind labels. They are leaving behind denominations. Um, but the, 
the the easy reach would be just to say, well, people just they're leaving behind faith, but they're not. That's the thing. People are still hungry. And that church is a great example. Um, People are hungry for God and for meaning and for connection and community. They're hungry for belonging. And so it's not an easy, we can't point our finger at people and say, something's wrong with everybody because they're just leaving the church. This is just the decline of Cult, it's the decline of morality. It's the, it's, we're just, this is what happens. We're just going the way of the devil because that's not actually true. It's that the church has broken so many hearts. It's broken so much trust. I mean, gosh, even just looking over these last five years, I, I, I've never experienced anything like this in my life, in my adult lifetime for sure. Um, just to see the, the, the politicizing of, a faith culture. I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I'm still, I sit here and just remain flabbergasted. Um, I wonder if you can talk about your observations, your thoughts on this politicized faith, um, on religion now being used as a political weapon, um, as, a, as a power play. Um, and what you think it's going to mean. Well, it is really shocking. And I mean, you said it perfectly because people are really leaving. It's not a blip. It's not just a sort of bump in some trend line. Yeah. But now we have 20, 30, 40 years of data that showed at first a slow decline, mostly around liberal or mostly around sort of old fashioned named churches, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Uh et cetera. Um, And then those churches kind of got to a certain point and they, they sort of, some of them have kind of stabilized. There've been a couple ticks up, then they go down again. So, so they've kind of, I think, gotten their market share, if you want to use that kind of language. Mm-hmm. Um, but the real drop off in the last 10 years has been with ev- white evangelicals. Yeah. Uh, the evangelical number still looks strong, but it looks strong mostly because of the inflow of Hispanic immigrant evangelicals Mm. who come from Latin America, and then they join some evangelical church here. Mm. Um, And so, so they've kept the numbers robust looking for evangelicals, but when you're looking just at white evangelical churches, it's, it's, it's a near collapse. I mean, it's so shocking how, how rapid it's been. Mm. So so that's, that's all real. And Mm. then the, the other thing is real too, is that people People might be leaving institutional yeah. settings like that, but they are not leaving God necessarily. That's right. Yeah. There are some people who are, and I get that. You know, some people just say, I can't do it anymore. I don't yeah. have the God language. I, I, I can't believe in theism any longer. Uh, but that's a small minority yeah. of, of the people who are leaving. The people who are leaving are wounded. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, broken hearted. I like that language. You know, some of them are angry and rightfully so, you know, mm. I was, I was angry yeah, me too. when I got, when I got kicked out, mm. people treated me terrible. They tried to take away my living. You know, mm. it was, I, I did not think kindly of them for a very long time. Yeah. Um, And so there's a real sort of painful set of emotions around the people who have left, but yet, you know, a lot of them are kind of looking around. Yeah. And trying to say what works, what works, mm-hmm. and so at that point, my mainline friends, my Methodist and sure. Lord, you know, Episcopal and Presbyterian friends, all say, "Well, they could come over here," mm. but the problem is, is that when people who have been so wounded by very conservative church settings sort of walk in the door of, say, your local nice traditional Presbyterian church. There are really great people in that building, mm. um, but they tend to be older yeah. and they tend, and, and I like older people, like I said, I'm 62, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, they tend to be older, whereas the leavers are tend to be younger. Yeah. And so there's a gap. And then they also tend to be sort of stuck. Yeah. And, and I say this with the greatest amount of love. Yeah. Um, they tend to be stuck 
worship wise, mm. you know, very traditional kinds of worship. They tend to be stuck in their stereotypes of what younger adults are like. They mm. tend to be stuck kind of in patterns of leadership. Mm. And right. so while they might be theologically very liberal and they might yeah. be very nice people and they really want folks to come to their churches, it's not immediately obvious how a person leaving this kind of setting would fit in this sort mm. of setting. Right. And so a lot of these people just kind of give up, you know, and they say, well, sorry, there's really no place for me to be. I, I liked the Presbyterians, but they didn't really speak my language. Mm. And so, so I certainly see that all the time is there, 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 there are places they might go, but the places they might go haven't been made ready for them. Yeah. And so, um, I, you know, I, I think that that's been part of the question I've been asking a lot of my books over the last 10 years is what makes these kinds of churches ready mm. for new generations of people yeah. who might wander in the doors or who might be reached, you know, mm. by a, a congregation like that. And what are and some so, of your conclusions there? Well, it was the same kinds of things that I saw back at Trinity, you know, genuine hospitality, mm -hmm. the capacity to be able to tell your story of faith, um, the the um, you have to have in place some level of spiritual practices where people can really sense and connect to God. Mm. So it's not it, the old fashioned kind of liberal church was a little like joining a rotary club, mm. you know, which is a nice organization and it does a lot of good work, but it didn't necessarily give you a terribly fulfilling spiritual life. And mm -hmm. so yeah. you have to have practices like teaching people how to pray or how to read the Bible differently, sure. um, how to, um, you know, do meditation, you know, yeah. all kinds of things that people are seeking as spiritual connections. So you have to be able to do that kind of stuff. So hospitality, um, a willingness to share your stories and a real genuine spiritual connection that you mm -hmm. can open up uh, to your congregation. So, so I think those three things are, they, they at least provide a pathway for those churches to be more vibrant and mm. to, and to, to do better work. Mm. So, so I think all that is, is there. And then you really want me to talk about politics? Yeah. Do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> I I do because we're there's just a there's so many okay. of us out here who are just befuddled and bewildered and honestly a little bit in mourning still because even though I don't identify evangelical anymore and that's not the church that I'm a part of anymore it's it is the church that raised me and so I feel well I, I'm not trying to be dramatic but I feel betrayed yeah. I feel I feel betrayed having been absolutely i mean indoctrinated on morality like <laughs> on morality and i mean and now just to see that none of that matters none of it and that never mattered i guess and i, I don't know i i i just would love the mic is yours what do you have <laughs> to say about this well it actually i I think I was kind of flummoxed by it myself, even though this is what my PhD is in. My PhD specialty area was the history and development of American fundamentalism. So you would think that I would have been the last person to be surprised <laughs> totally, <laughs> right? <laughs> by yes. what was coming. Um, but uh, no, I, I was surprised. Mm -hmm. And so this past year when the pandemic is raging, yeah. I'm at home, stuck in my office, and I'm writing my new book. And the new book is called Freeing Jesus. Yes. And in the central part of the book, in chapters three, four, and five, I tell the stories of the years in which I was an evangelical. Mm. And in chapter three, I talk about, you know, coming into Scottsdale Bible and liking it. And, you know, I have carried around, and I didn't know it until I was working on this book, I have carried around shame about that hmm. because I have so many friends who grew up in fundamentalism and they have literally said to me, you know, I grew up in it and it was really hard to get out, but you went into it hmm. and, and they said, you know, I can't figure out why anybody would do that. Hmm. And so I felt kind of ashamed, you know, like, so 
well, my friends at least have an excuse. They were born there, you know, uh, but I picked it. And so I went back and I thought, you know, what was that 15 year old girl like? Why did she choose that church? What was it? And guess what it was? Mm-hmm. It was about hospitality. Sure. It was about being part of a community that knew its story and could tell stories, both of your own spiritual life and of the Bible. Yeah. And it was about connecting people to better spiritual practice, deeper yeah. spiritual practices. This is what the evangelical church does well. Right. Yeah. So it's about learning how to read the Bible and learning how to pray and learning how to share my faith in the world and mm-hmm. all of these kinds of things. And so those are the same three things that later I would run into at the liberal church, mm. Santa Barbara, but it was in this evangelical package. And so yeah. all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, well, that's why I liked it. Sure. Of course. They, they gave me a home mm-hmm. when I was a hurt 15 year old girl. Mm-hmm. And what is, does a young teenager want besides a home? Mm, right. And so so I, I liked it. And then I went to evangelical college. And boy, did I love that. Because mm-hmm. that was about studying theology for the first time. Sure. We had this renegade uh, professor who was very young. And I think that he might have been the very first ever uh, evangelical theology prof anywhere in the United States to teach a class in liberation theology. Oh, yeah. So we're sitting in a class in evangelical college, and we're learning about James Cone and Oscar Romero and Gustavo Gutierrez. Mm. And it's like, this is not standard evangelical fare. Sure. And so we're getting all stirred up about, you know, the kingdom of God is among the poor and the preferential option of the poor. And we decide as a group of students that we're going to go and we're going to do something about it. Okay. And so we, we started a street ministry in Santa Barbara, and that was amazing. But then we, we thought, well, that's not that hard. We're just kind of going in, you know, Santa Barbara. How tough is Santa Barbara street ministry, you know? Yeah. So we uh, started going down to Mexico. Mm -hmm. where we did environmental cleanup and we were building an orphanage and we were um, working with churches to take care of the needs of the children in these little impoverished villages and all throughout Ensenada. And so that was an eye-opening experience. Um, I'll never forget when, you know, I was like 20 probably, and we drove into this one village and the village was made out of tires and I asked the, the, the person who's with me, the, trans, the translator, I said, what's going on here? And he said, oh, this village, <laughs> he said, this is American trash. Americans throw their old tires over the border in San Diego, and it's the only building material that these people have. So they go pick up the tires in the back of their pickup trucks, and they come here and they build their houses out of our trash. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when you're 20 and you see that, mm-hmm. it just sort of rocks your your world, sure. you know, it, especially if you're from Southern California, where it's just money growing yeah. on trees, you right. know? And so, so we all sort of became um, these very radical pacifist, environmentally concerned, um, deeply committed Christians, where we understood that Jesus set a table in the world and that the lordship of Jesus mm-hmm. was really being the one who was at the head of the table and, it, and then invited everyone to dine. And so that was what Lord was. And this is where the political question starts getting answered. That was in the late 1970s. And so we're doing our thing traveling the world, being Christian radicals, reading Sojourners magazine. We started an alternative dorm for the vegetarians on campus. I mean, you sure. it. <laughs> we sure. did it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we started hearing that back East, there was this guy named Jerry Falwell and uh, that he had started this thing mm. called the, the moral majority. Yeah. And one day in a class, a theology class, a student brought a, Time magazine and it had Jerry Falwell on the cover. Mm-hmm. And um, here we were in California, 21, 22 years old, with this is our experience of evangelicalism, this golden, glowing, sort of liberationist evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. And we just laughed. Mm-hmm. We thought Jerry Falwell was like a fool. We couldn't mm-hmm. believe that anybody believed any of it. Mm-hmm. And the professor who knew better, the same guy who taught us liberation theology, he was from Missouri. And so he said, um, well, you know, 
California is a little different. Mm. And he said, there are people who are evangelicals all over America who will agree with Jerry Falwell way more than they'd agree with you. Yeah. And what Falwell presented was an idea of Jesus as Lord over Mm. an ordered universe. Mm -hmm. And the more that he talked and the more that people followed him who talked, it was very easy to analyze what they thought the problem was. And that is the problem with American society was that people had gotten out of their place. They had upset the divinely structured order of things. Mm -hmm. And the way to get America back to being God's blessed chosen land, chosen people, uh, was to restate, re- reinstate this order. And the order, of course, man, you know, I can recite Ephesians 5 in my sleep, um, was found in Ephesians 5. It was, you know, men, yeah. women, children, and then whatever you want to call that, workers, slaves, servants, Uh they tried to dress it up. At first, they didn't want to call it slaves. But later on, I'd hear people actually refer to that as uh, those people as slaves Mm -hmm. and make arguments for a reinstatement of slavery, which shocked Mm -hmm. me to my core. Um, But so they wanted this pyramid-shaped structure and that Jesus would be the Lord at the top of that. Mm -hmm. And that the the law that would govern us would not just be the constitution, but it would also be biblical law. Right. And so what happened right there in that crack in time, and that was my senior year in college, interestingly enough. So I'm watching this, you know, like this really idealistic, radical, young evangelical. And um, there were two ideas of lordship. One was Jesus, the Lord of the household, setting a table for all the guests. Mm. And the other was Jesus, the Lord of the universe, who Mm -hmm. demanded obedience, order, Mm -hmm. and would claim his authority over all. Mm -hmm. And at the time, me and my friends, we thought that the table was going to win. And by the time we graduated from college, um, Oscar Romero had been murdered by a right-wing death squad in El Salvador Mm. and Jerry Falwell was at Ronald Reagan's inauguration. Yeah. And that, that moment set up what would become, you know, I think a fight within evangelical religion more on a grander scale. And slowly but surely the 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 lord of the household got pushed out the door and it got replaced by this this powerful uh warrior king jesus and um i think that the natural trajectory of that now now that i mean once i realized that there were these two visions of lordship and that that i I literally lived through it Mm -hmm. and I literally watched it develop. And I remember my heart being ripped out when that time magazine came into the classroom and all of the stuff that happened along the way, um, because I ran into those same people again, when they kicked me out of the college. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But, um, but that, that idea of Lordship would, would win. Mm -hmm. And, it became evangelicalism, at least 80% of it. Yeah. And, and that's the trajectory to Trump. Mm. And it makes perfect sense then. So the morals of the, the secular ruler who is kind of sitting there right under Jesus mm. doesn't, doesn't really matter yeah. because Jesus is ultimately the Lord and Jesus is the one who's sort of direct or you know, you've seen all those paintings of like Jesus standing behind Trump as Trump yeah. is signing bills yeah but Jesus has got his pen Mm. and that's all that needs to be the case because Jesus is the one that's on top. Mm. And so they're so grateful to Trump because he was the strong man who was able to sort of vanquish the last of their foes. Mm. So it's a, I think it's a really ugly story, but I think it's a theological story. I think it was 30 years in development at the very least. Um, And um not long ago, I was talking with Jim Wallace about this, you know, and Jim was always the 
the Lord of the household and setting the bigger table and, yeah. you know, the radical evangelical stuff. And, um, much later, Jim and I would get to be friends and we are really pretty good friends. And we were talking about this time and I didn't want to say it, but as the conversation unfolded and we realized more deeply how what we'd been through right around 1980 set the, the stage. Yeah. And, and Jim literally said, well, we know who won. Hmm. And to hear somebody, you know, who was like the old warrior of radical yeah. evangelicalism. Right. He was. Yeah. Just sort of say, well, mm-hmm. this round of history, they got us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a bitter pill. It's a bitter pill. I recently took a trip for a speaking engagement on a plane. You guys, it'd been a while. It'd been a minute. I shared some travel photos on my social pages and so many of you eagle eye spied my shoes and wanted to know if there were Rothy's. And I'm here to tell you that yes, yes, they were. I don't know about you, but anytime I travel, I want to be comfy, like comfortable. The last thing I want while walking a million miles in airport terminals or waiting a million minutes on flight delays is to have uncomfortable shoes. But I also want them to be cute. So Rothy's is the MVP here. My go-to shoe from them is the slip-on sneaker in gray camo. It goes with everything, but has some fun sass, no laces to mess with. Plus, you just toss them in the washing machine and they come out fresh and good as new. It's like magic. Rothy's also has lace-up sneakers in addition to the slip-ons, along with adorable wrap sandals, flats, you name it, all super comfy, like walking on clouds, sisters. What I also love about Rothy's is they are a socially responsible brand operating with care for the planet. This is a company that is reducing its footprint literally by crafting shoes and handbags out of thread made from 100 million plastic water bottles that would have otherwise been ocean bound. I have zero idea how they do it and make all their shoes and bags look so cute, but they just do. So Upgrade your closet with washable, sustainable, stylish shoes and bags from Rothy's. Plus, they just launched men's shoes. So make sure to check them out for you or the guy in your life. You can check out all their latest collections available right now at rothys.com slash for the love. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash for the love. Self-care has become such a hot button topic. And I'm not mad about it because if you're anything like me, this sort of thing becomes very easily abandoned, forgotten, left in the dust. I have a feeling you can relate. Self-care looks different for everyone and it can be a lot of things. We all know it isn't just about manis and petties and spa days, of course. Sometimes it's about saying no when you would have said yes, about setting boundaries, about turning the TV off, about going to bed early, about therapy. Therapy can feel hard, really hard, before you actually begin, or if you are jumping back in after some time away, that's where better help can come in and be such a beautiful thing. It has an easy bar for entry. That's because it's professional therapy from the comfort and convenience of your own space. And you can start communicating with a therapist in under 24 hours. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is also committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. That's why they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. And their licensed professional counselors have a broad range of expertise categories, specializing in everything from depression to stress and anxiety to relationships, trauma, anger, family conflict, LGBTQ issues, grief, so much more. If you have an inkling that you need to activate therapy as part of your self-care, I cannot encourage you more in this. I want you to start caring for yourself today. So as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Join more than 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash for the love. What's your projection? I mean, if those, if that's, if this was set in motion in the early '80s, which it was, and here we are, the very predictable, natural outcome to that 
brand of theology and um, a, a dominating, um, conquering savior um, who demands subservience. Um, what is your projection? I mean, here we are. It's pretty, the, the chasm is wide. Um, where do you think it goes from here? I mean, this, we're at 81%, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's big. This is big. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've been working on a piece and in that piece, I say, I, I say that the, the good of evangelical of white evangelicalism was back in the 1970s when it really wasn't quite so white. Hmm. Yeah. And, and totally. Yeah. This, and what this I, belongs in the conversation. Yeah. And, and what I, what I meant by that was, you know, I, I was mostly in white evangelical spaces, Sure, but we had, we didn't privilege the white part or at least not consciously privilege the white part. I think there was a lot of subconscious sure. sort of privileging of whiteness, uh, but that was really submerged under evangelical mm. good news for the world, bring yeah. everybody to the table and our, the first place I learned anti-racism was at that college when I was sure. 20 years old. Of course. Right. You know, and, and so the first place I learned feminism, the first place I learned about global issues, the first place I learned about any kind of radical theology that was mm -hmm. inclusive was at that college. Um, and so what my dream is, is that we won't let that memory die. Mm -hmm. And we will remember a day when the evangelical world word was privileged over the white word. Mm. And so the, the good of white evangelicalism is when it isn't quite so white. Mm. And I, I think there are people who are ready to jump on that vision mm -hmm. and to say, yes, I'm not going to let these people take my history away from me. Yeah. Instead, I'm going to, I'm going to grab that history and I'm going to say, Yes. You know, here I stand. This was true. This is true. And you can win all you like, but the table remains. That's a very hopeful vision. Um, that's a very generous um, position to take that there is. So you believe there's something worth saving in there. You think that the system, the institution, really, of evangelicalism is not corrupted beyond repair? No, I think the institutions are pretty well completely corrupted. I think what remains is memory. Okay. And that's a powerful thing. You know, if you think about how the Lord's Supper is, do this in remembrance of me. You know, mm -hmm. after Jesus is long gone, the 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 power really of the Jesus community was standing around a table mm. and remembering. And so that had nothing to do with institutions. It That's had nothing, you know, had nothing yeah. to do with any of those things that we usually associate with organized religion. Mm. It was a group of friends who claimed the power of the table. Yeah. And so um, that's where my hope is. So I think that there's just enough people who, who bear memory and mm. who can testify to the truth of the matter, yeah. uh, there will be something that will be saved, um, yeah. but it will not be institutions and probably won't be church buildings or I don't know. Well, I want to talk to you about that um, as we kind of begin to, mm -hmm. to wrap here. Um, right. The numbers tell us it won't be church buildings. The numbers tell us the church, there's just even, you know, I'm in Austin here and it is like a church graveyard. I mean, there are all these empty churches. They've been around forever, but they're they're empty now. And um, so, you know, the this is this is the data. And so, I'm with you. I deeply um, know that Jesus. I mean, as you so beautifully titled your book, "Freeing Jesus." Jesus was never encapsulated in a in a church building. I mean, he really, 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 truly wasn't. We always said that, but it was kind of a catchy thing to say, but it really is true. And so what do you think? Is there a point to church anymore? Is there, is there a value in fighting for, um, for lack of a better word, uh, um, 
kind of the redemption of the institution, like in the way that we've always known it. What, what do you think about this? Is can we only are we only really going to find true Jesus outside of that um, in, in the wilderness, or is there something to be um, battled for here? Um. I think that uh, you, you caught yourself too, when you use the word fight and battle, hmm. you know, I, I think that for me, I spent a lot of uh, years, you know, like 15, 10 years ago, thinking that I had to fight for the future of the main line. Yeah. And cause I wanted those churches to survive. I, I think memory is very important, but nostalgia is bad. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's not what we do when we're gathered around the table with Jesus. We're not saying, oh, wasn't, what isn't that, wasn't that great when Jesus walked with us in the, you know, mm. in the garden and yeah. everything would be perfect with the white picket fence. And if Jesus just had it like it was in, in uh, four, yes. you know, whatever, you know, whatever year, 22 AD. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's nostalgia, but memory is the capacity to live into a story mm. that animates history that animates who we understand ourselves to be and animates community. Memory is a very beautiful thing and human beings can't live without it. But we, but we humans also don't always get that and we turn it into nostalgia. Mm. And so, so nostalgia hinders everything. Mm. I mean, if you mainline Catholic, uh, evangelical, it doesn't matter. If you're trying to recreate the church in the 1950s, you are going to fail. Right. Right, because we don't have a time machine, and this isn't yeah. a Star Trek, Trek yeah. episode. Yeah, and it, and if you don't fail, you get Donald Trump, make America great again. Yeah, right. right. I mean, that's that's classic a, nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's perfect for yeah. evangelicals that feel like everything is failing. Yeah. So so that's yeah. nostalgia. Memory is a different thing. Okay. Um, and so so that creates grief and anger and regret. That's you right. Get, all those feelings, nostalgia creates a whole set of negative feelings, depression, mm -hmm. persecution, yeah. Um, yeah, doubt, totally. resentment. Nope. So everybody wants to think about the future, but when you, and I, and I think it's good to do that. Planning is good. I'm an ENTJ. I love mm. to plan things. Sure. You know, so planning is good. Um, and, and, you know, having a sort of a sense of where the timeline is going is a good thing, but not everybody agrees about what the future is going to look like. Sure. And as soon as you start talking about it, you, you enter in this field of almost conflict between mm. people's visions for the future. Well, I think the future should be like this. I think it should be like this. You're a terrible person because you mm -hmm. think it's. And so you get conflict and you get anxiety. And those things, conflict and anxiety, and a kind of what I call dashed hopes, so, so that becomes the field of expectation. And if your expectations are met, your hopes are dashed. Mm. And so, so what I have done, this is Zen Diana now, is that I really think the most productive thing that we can do now is now. It's mm. good. Is literally to just, just say, okay, we're going to figure out how to hold on to memory in that beautiful spiritual way mm -hmm. that's demonstrated through the primary sacrament of Christianity through the Lord's Supper. And we're going to think about the future, not in the sense of, I know what the future holds and you don't because you're in your dumb kind of mm -hmm. sense, but in the sense where Jesus says, um, don't worry about the future. Mm -hmm. Look at the lilies of the field. And so this is whole, my new whole church growth theory. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Look at the flowers. <laughs> That's right. Look at yes. the lilies of the field. Yes. They neither spin not nor. And so, <laughs> and so, so, so that is really what I hope for right now for people yeah. is do the best you can right now and mm -hmm. recognize that this is a, to use a fancy word, a liminal period Sure. Between what was and what will be, and you can't rush liminal periods. Mm. They have to do their work. You have to be present in them. Mm -hmm. You have to learn from them. And then when the time mm. is the right time, you move out of liminality, better equipped mm. for what is coming. That's good. So that's where, that's where I am with all this right now. It took me a really long time to get to mm. that. Zen like yeah. um, church growth theory. <laughs>
I know, but it's nice. It's a, um, it's a way to hold it gently mm-hmm. instead of squeezing it just to damn death, yeah. which is, you know, our history. That's what we've done. We've squeezed it to damn death um, and, and squeezed the life out of it. Um, we're, we're just left with rules and arguments and camps and silos and forgotten the whole plot, forgotten the whole plot. So I, I appreciate the, the gentle nature of the here and now the today, um, do the best you can with what, you know. And this has got so much going on. Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's not like we're all just going to sit around and meditate. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, oh, I yeah. mean, we yeah. both know. We have we work at deal hand with, here. Yeah. Yeah. We got to work with racism. We got to figure yeah. out what to do with all those wounded. Yes, exactly. But we have to be yes. an, an inviting presence. I mean, there's so much to be done in the yes. seminal period. You're right. But all that work can only really be done if we're in a, a decent place ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's good. And, I love this. I love this. I love your words. I am. Um, I love your wisdom. I want to ask you three just quick and off the top of your head questions that I'm asking everybody in the transition series, which is um, just so whatever comes to mind. So besides the ones that you have shared with us, um, can you tell us briefly about a transition in your life, either one that you chose or one that chose you? <laughs> without your consent, um, and what you, what you learned? Oh, well, that's, I I was thinking the entirety of the new book is all transitions. It's one transition after another. Um, but, um, so I'm skilled at it now. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Yeah. We get muscle memory for this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think that in some ways the, the, the best one or, or the, the one I'm living into most is the one that I'm going through right now. And there is just this fascinating thing that happens when you turn 60. And all my friends told me that this would happen. And I just mm. sort of sat back and I went, no, oh, that's not going to happen. Um, and boy, it's just like, wake up one morning and there you are. And, and what mm-hmm. it is, is, is this crazy sense that you know what you know better than you've ever known it. Mm. And you know how much you don't know with more humility than you've ever experienced. That's great. I love that. And so that's the transition that I'm in now. And, and I think what I just described to you about my Zen church yeah. attitude, yeah. That, that's also the attitude that I have about my own life and my current relationship with Jesus. Hmm. It comes out of that whole moment of knowing what I know better than I've ever known it and knowing what I don't know with more humility than ever. I love that. I hope we all have that to look forward to. That sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it does come with a few aches and pains and sure. yes, <laughs> totally. it's, but okay. it's, it is, it's really, it's really surprisingly rich time. I think, mm. especially for women. Yeah. I love that answer. That's perfect. One last question. This is from Barbara Brown. Um, as I love her question, and I ask everybody this one, answer it however you want to. What's saving your life right now? What is saving my life right now? Walking. Mm, mm-hmm. What does that look walking. like for you? Morning, evening? A couple times a day, actually. Yeah. Um, and I live in a suburban neighborhood and I walk around streets and I try to find streets I haven't been on before. Yeah. And so here in Virginia, especially this spring, Oh my gosh, we've had the most glorious spring mm. of the year. So everything's been blooming and the trees are all flowered and you turn a corner and yeah. there's a lilac bush, you know, so walking. Oh, good for you. You picked a good one. A lot of ancillary benefits to that one. <laughs> um, awesome. Um, thank you so much for being on today. Can you just quickly tell everybody listening about your latest book, where to find you, where to follow you, how to, how to tap into your work in the world. Uh, Well, the latest book is my 11th. Oh my gosh. The the 11th book is freeing Jesus. And it is what I call memoir theology. Good. Hmm. And it's, it is a memoir, but Mm -hmm. it's, it's really theology written out of experience. And it's an invitation Hmm. for other people to write 
their theologies from experiences. I love that. Beautiful. So I've, I've loved the way that this book is being received and it's Mm. um, been really fun to talk about. So, so uh, there's that project and people can reach me through my website, which is Mm. just my name, www.dianabutlerbass.com. And if you go there, like most websites, up in the corner, there's little icons where you can connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, yeah. um, Twitter, or sign up for my newsletter, which is called The Cottage. Mm. And that's where my office is in my yeah. backyard, a little Perfect. she shed. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm in. <laughs> well, I'm just so grateful for you, Diana. And your work has been a lot to me and it's taught me and it's comforted me. It's stretched me. And I'm thankful so much for your voice, for your courage uh, to just, um, to follow Jesus wherever he took you. And, um, and it's, it's lending the next generation, our own brand of courage um, when we have seen it now, like walked out. And so thanks for being here today. It's just delightful to talk to you. Well, if I could have inspired you in any way Mm. of what is your amazing life of courage. Mm. I am exceedingly grateful. Mm. Okay. Until we meet in person again, it's it's coming. It's happening. (laughs) We're almost there. Oh my gosh. Yes. (laughs) We're almost there. Almost there. Thank you. Have a good day. We took up more of your time than usual. Um, There's just so much here. We could have gone on and on and on. This particular conversation is so poignant and it is so relevant and it's so right now. And it's where a lot of us are, I know. And so um, you will love Diana's book, Freeing Jesus. It will be like like a cold glass of water on a hot day. Um, she is a wonderful teacher, just a wonderful teacher. So, um, if you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, we'll have this entire episode, all the show notes. And then obviously we will link to everything Diana mentioned, all of her socials, her website, her books, everything, one-stop shop for you. Um, and so follow her, learn from her, listen to her. Thanks for sharing this podcast with the people that you know will want to hear it, right? Who are kind of in this place, in this space. Um, You do that so well. Also, you guys, thank you for subscribing and rating and reviewing the show. We're just, you know, 30 million (laughs) downloads. It's just bananas. It's just crazy. Thank you for being faithful listeners and um smart and engaging listeners. We have the best community. So um, Laura and her team and Amanda and I are grateful for you. We love to bring you this show week in and week out, always thinking about how to um, center important conversations on this show that you want to hear, that we want to talk about, and that matter to the world. Okay, everybody. Loving this series. More on the transition series next week. You're not going to want to miss it. See you then.